addition. It's not Ian Smalley. Um, by the way, Smalley was here last summer. I don't know if you guys met him, but... Um, and then there's the introduction by the author to his own work. And so last week's introduction, my, excuse me, my introduction lecture was kind of to con really to confute both. <laughs> I don't know what that word means, but I'm gonna start using it. Uh, <laughs> it's really just to bring together both uh, and give us some, some groundwork to work with. And, um, and hopefully that was, that was profitable. If not, you can tell me. It wouldn't be the first time I'm criticized. Uh, today, we're gonna go over chapter one, but only sections one and two of chapter one. So there are three sections in chapter one. The law of God inscribed on man's heart at creation. The law of God in a form of covenant of works. And then the last one is um, the law in the hand of Christ, the blessed mediator, and as a rule of life to all true believers. That, that one's a lot more practical, a lot more rich. You might find it just more devotional. I found the whole chapter very devotional, but we're gonna cover that third section of chapter one um, by itself. Uh, there you go. And uh, we'll handle that next. Sunday. Okay, well, why don't I pray and we'll get into some of these things and here are more copies if anybody needs them. Gracious Heavenly Father, we come before you and that right there alone is a grace gift. We have your throne of grace to um, send up all of our requests, confess our deepest sins, uh, make known to you the greatest struggles in our heart. And we love the fact that we can come to you, that you are, although an unapproachable God, you are an approachable God. And for that, we love you and give you praise. We ask you for your help this morning as we um, look at your law, how we are made in your image and how we are uh, inextricably connected with your law as we were made in your image. So help us this morning and um, give us wisdom, give us listening ears, um, a teachable spirit. And we pray this in Christ's name, amen. Okay. So to start off, I guess I'll just reiterate real quickly. These lectures are, are really just meant to summarize the chapters and to emphasize a couple things that I think are worth emphasizing. You guys can read the chapters on your own, learn on your own, gain on your own, and do that, and then become teachers of others. But it is a, it's not the easiest read, you know? It's not like Jack and Jill ran up the hill kind of thing. So I think there are places that we could kind of sit for a while, dwell on, and learn about, and it would be for our profit. I have a couple... If you have your notes there, I just want to talk about his definition of terms briefly, and then we're going to go and cover sections one and two. I think it should be fairly helpful that in the first couple paragraphs, he, um, he defines his words. As we talk about the law and the gospel, we have to define what we're talking about. And so he says in the first, I think in the very first paragraph, this is what I do mean, and this is what I don't mean. So he says, there is law, that term is used in an extended sense. The law, the word law is used for the Pentateuch, first five books of the Bible. The word law is used in the Old Testament as a summary of the Old Testament. The word law is used as the entire word of God in, in Psalm 19. The word law is used in John 1.17 as referring to the Old Testament and not the New Testament. So we have that distinction there. And then, and then to, maybe to confute, I don't know, I gotta look that word up. To confound all of us, he says the law is also used to refer to the doctrines of the gospel. And, and, and that is might where it get a little tricky and a little perplexing. Well, if there is the law and there is the gospel and they are most definitely different, how can the law be referring to the gospel? And yet the Old Testament does that. If you just 
flip real quickly over to Isaiah chapter two. I mean, this is just very quickly here. Come, let us go up to the mountain of Yahweh, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways and that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go the law. Now, this is a, this is a, a statement looking far, far into the future where the gospel will spread broad and wide, whether that refers to an earthly millennial state, as some would say, or a, an eternal state, or the new covenant. We don't have to get into all that. What we do know is that the law going out from Zion is a reference to the good news going out from Zion. The, the one who rules in Zion, our Lord, will publish his law and he will teach all his people, right, directly. So, so there, just very briefly, the law is in an extended sense. Sometimes it use, it's referring to the Pentateuch. Sometimes it's referring to the Old Testament. And sometimes it's referring to the gospel. And, um, and I'm sure you picked up those definitions as you're reading there. On the other hand, the law is used in a restricted sense. And this is where he really starts to narrow down his definition. He, I quote him on page nine. The rule, this is the law in his, in his definition. The rule that God has prescribed to his rational creatures in order to direct and oblige them to the right performance of all their duties to him. Okay? So the law is given to his rational creatures who can reason and deduce and, and know and to oblige them to commit them to the right performance of all that God commands them to do, okay? And, and in that restricted sense, he'll use another, another kind of a subcategory of, of either natural law or positive law, okay? Natural law is the law of nature which all men are bound to. There are laws and rules that are timeless. You might say murder is a timelessly eternal rule, a law that all know is wrong unless their consciences are seared, okay? That's a, that's a natural law. There, and then there's the positive law, which are laws that are given by God but are also subject to change. So they are to be commanded and to be done obediently, happily, yet they depend upon, as his words say, God's sovereign will, and yet they might change over time. So he commands Adam and Eve not to eat of the forbidden fruit. That was, a, that was a timely located command in which no one else is given that command. That command has, was given and then it was expired. The seventh day Sabbath, that's, an, that's a positive law. It's a law that was given, but then subject to change. Ceremonial laws of Israel, var various other laws we can talk about, but these are all what we call in theology positive laws. They are, they are given by God's sovereign will to do until he says, don't do them, okay? So, so that's just a brief definition of terms. You'll see those words used uh, quite a bit as we go through the book. Okay, so section one, the law as inscribed on the heart of man at creation. What was it like to be made in God's image? That's the question we should ask as we read this section. What was it like for Adam and Eve to be made in God's image? Does it mean that they're made after his spiritual image? Does it mean that they're made out of his physical image? God has no body. Um, God isn't a giant angel. He has no spiritual image. To be made in God's image is to be made, as he says, in God's moral likeness. God is a reasonable being, if we might, if we could say that infinitely, but, but he's also a morally perfect one. And so when he makes man, Adam and Eve, he makes them in his moral likeness. So his his sense, not only his sense, but, but God's own moral perfections of goodness, of righteousness, of justice, of love. This is what it be, is to be made in God's image. 
So just flip forward real quick to Colossians chapter 2. I think he even mentions this. Excuse me, not two, but three. Are those kids singing a Christmas song? That's gorgeous. Awesome. Okay, so in Colossians 3, uh, I'm not going to give you the whole context. He is in, in 3.10, he says, because of, the, because of the, re, the new birth, because of salvation, we have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. So there there are a couple things we can kind of sew together and tie together here, but most definitely what we can say is salvation is bringing man back into the f- image which he fell from, and that image being a moral image. For what does Paul say in chapter 3? Uh, I would say most of chapter 3, but moral qualities that make up the Christian's life, right? So we kill sin. We don't do sexual morality, impurity, We're not known for passion and evil desire and covetousness and all of these things, but we're known to put on compassionate hearts, kindness, humility. These are moral qualities that God is kind of putting Humpty Dumpty back together again as we have fallen from grace. And so to be made in God's moral likeness is to be made in his image. And, And just real quick, like we can see the application very immediate when we're evangelizing or talking to people about coming to Christ, this is why it is impossible to become saved, we just use that expression as shorthand, by good works. How is someone going to, after they have become, he uses the word obliterated, the the moral image has been obliterated and perverted, how can a finite creature, by doing good things, create in himself such a moral excellency that he would be back into God's very image. It's not just back into Adam. Because what was Adam? He was made in God's perfect image. So all the perfections and the high excellency of who God is and and what is good and what is beauty and what is right, that's what Adam knew. That's what Adam had. And it is thus impossible to just do things in order to get there. What, what was Adam's morality? How pure was he? By analogy, God's intrinsic purity put in man. God is infinite. He is eternal. He is uh, incomprehensible. And, and, and sometimes the more we even try to talk about God, the more we get away from who he is. We just are without language. But God's intrinsic purity is the image which Adam possessed. And this is in his uh, DNA, you might want to say. He says on page 13, this obliges him to be perfect and perpetual obedience in all possible states of the creature. Since man is the creature of God, and since in his creation he was made in the image of God, he owes all possible subjection and obedience to God, considered as his benign creator. Benign, in that sense, being the good creator. So the law in God and man means he is obliged to perfect and perpetual obedience. To be otherwise is to be an alternate human. That's how starkly we have to understand this. To be man is to be made under God, right? Not equal to God, under God, but possessing God's moral perfection of goodness and then obliging himself to do it, to to cast off off the law, which is intrinsic to one's own DNA, is to be a subhuman, We have our identity of humans of being attached to who God is. If we throw away God or say he doesn't exist or cast off his law, we are saying we are an alternate form of humanity. That's that's the breach of the fall and the sin that we are talking about. 
Now, just to kind of go back to a couple of terms here, I notice in chapter one, he was using certain terms um, in, in various ways. He meant, I mentioned earlier the law of nature, the natural law. And here in, on page 13, he says the law of nature is, is a law in the sense of it accords with what ought to be natural to all men. What is like what should be normally right? What is that gut instinct, right? But also it's called the law of nature because it's founded on God's nature and interwoven with the nature of man. See, we are not, a, we are not some in substance of our, of our actions, but our, our very being, our very nature is to be in the image of God. But the image of God is God's nature. So we can't know ourselves apart from knowing God. Calvin says this perfectly clear in his first two or three uh, paragraphs in his Institutes of the Christian Religion. If we want to know God, we need to know ourselves. If we want to know ourselves, we got to know God. They go hand in hand. They go hand in hand. Not because we're equal, because we're forever attached to him because we're made in his image. So you'll read in there the law of nature or the natural law, but that's what he, that's what he refers to. It's the law of nature because it's a law of the nature of God being given in some way possessed by Adam in his nature. And not just in Adam, but all of us, even though it's been wholly perverted. And then he'll also use the word, the moral law. And he says, it's the moral law because it comes from God as our moral governor of, our, of man's moral qualities and actions. So this moral law is basically synonymous with the law of nature. It's basically synonymous with being made in God's image. And it's, it's practically synonymous with the Ten Commandments. There, there is some overlap that doesn't occur, but they're very, very close in relation. When God gives the Ten Commandments at Sinai, he's giving timeless, eternal truths which should be done at all times, right? So this, this law of nature obliges us. He says this a couple times. We have an obligation to obey God because God is the creator. This is on page 14. Proprietor, preserver, benefactor, and governor of man. He holds all our marbles, so to speak. He completely owns us. Is that door not wanting to stay open? Okay. So that's God. God is the creator, proprietor, preserver, benefactor, and governor of man. The man is the creature, property, and subject of God. Okay. You know, as you, as you read this, was there any sense in which man lives on an island apart from God? No, not at all. We are not autonomous at all. You know, the word autonomous, we think is a virtue. It's a horrible, horrible vice. We were not made to be autonomous, self-laud, self-ruled, okay? We were made to be ruled by God. Autonomy, autonomous, is sin. It is sin. It is us trying to break free from God's perfect moral goodness and set up our own. So he says, I think on, on, this is on 14, the law cannot cease to bind us as long as God continues to be God and man continues to be man. So here's the firm, unbreakable link. As long as God exists and he has man, we are obliged to obey him. And we can't sneak out from underneath that. Um, what is the consequence of the fall in regard to the law? He says, oh, I don't know what, I don't have the page number on here. It is the obliteration of the natural law in man. 
That's the fall. The obliteration of the natural law in man. Obliteration of natural law on man is such that it requires God to renew it and no one else. This is kind of going back to what I said about Colossians. The natural law, the image of God is so interwoven with who we are and the fall is so destructive of it that we are not able to patch ourselves up again to do good things or to approve ourselves to God in any way. No, it requires, it is so perverted and gone, it requires God to renew it. He quotes um, Hebrews 8 there. Hebrews 8.10 says, this is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, declares the Lord, I will put my laws into their minds. I will write them onto their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. This is like the goal of all things, right? To be, but sometimes we've used the word salvation as the, the ultimate. And salvation is not the ultimate. Salvation is penultimate. Salvation is a means to a glorious end. The glorious end is living in communion with God. And that glorious end could be said in another way. To have God's law rightly inscribed on our heart that we might love him and have a relationship with him. Yes, Tony. When I was reading this, one of the things that struck me is this um, eternal free will. It doesn't exist either. When you, because we live according to his will, we are not autonomous, therefore yeah. free will is a construct of man. It's a construct of the matrix. Yeah. Yeah. It's an illusion. Now, we need to be fair to define what does free mean and what does will mean. Even our confession of faith has a chapter on free will. This is what we mean, this is what we don't mean. But the idea that we have what theologians would say is a libertarian free will, I can do anything I want whenever I want with whoever I want. No. That, that's not only governed and constrained by sin, that, we won't have a free will in heaven. I can't sin. Now, if I want to go out to the reservoir and go fishing, what do I have to do? I have to weigh the factors. Do I want to spend money on gas? Bait? Buy, rent a boat? I have factors. We all have factors pushing in on us, dictating to us what we do and don't want to do. The fact that we are just free to do anything we want is, is an illusion. But we do have a will in the sense of we act in accordance with our will and we act freely. God does not cajole us or move us and make us do things against our will. We, we act freely. We make free choices. Since our obligation is to him, um, and he sets the standard and the tone and the whatever, um, yeah. I've not seen it quite this succinct before. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah, he, he will go on to say this, this natural law, this moral image in man is, he says it's wholly obliterated. And then a couple paragraphs later, he says, actually, scratch that. You know, it's wholly perverted. It is not wholly obliterated. Um, but it is wholly perverted. He quotes Romans 1, 21 and 32. And really, if you were just take that whole half of that uh, pa- uh, chapter, uh, you know what that speaks of. Um, the wholly perverted image of God means we, we substitute the glory of God for lesser things. And as a consequence of that, we are led into all kinds of sin and harm and misery for ourselves and for others. Um, he does go on to say, and so it is not completely obliterated because it is true that all men, now this is controversial, but I think it's right on. It might not be controversial for us today, but it is true that all men know God exists. That's that's Romans 1, okay? It is true that all men exist, that God is to be worshiped, that that we should not injure one another, harm one another, that parents are to be honored, we might say today, that's not true for everybody. That's completely 
up for debate. Uh, and he says part of this natural law, which is still in us, although it is perverted, is to do unto others as we would have them do unto us. There are timeless rules. We could say fragments or, or ruins of the fall. Ruins of a great, wonderful city in which God's law reigned and ruled, but now because of the fall is destroyed. It's all in rubble. It's all in ruins. But there are still... Uh, signs and um, hints that God exists. We ought to love one another and, and these kind of things. He says, he says this out of Romans 2, uh, 14 and 15, um, because there he says, hey, Paul says, even the Gentiles know what to do and what not to do. <clears throat> even the Gentiles know this. This is not divine revelation from God to Israel. This is, this is revelation to all people. And in that section, I won't camp on it, um, but he uses the words light of nature and light of reason in that way. Those terms could be stretched out to use to be meaning other things, but in this context, he's practic. I'm not saying it's a complete synonym, but he's using light of reason, what all men know, light of nature, very synonymously with natural law, moral law, image of God, what we know um, by being made in God's image. Okay, so, wow, that went faster than I thought. Summary of that section, the law in man at creation shows that mankind is inseparably connected with his maker. For in what it means to be man is determined by what God is in himself. And again, we cannot separate ourselves from that. And, and you know, you will, not you will, you have spoken with people who want to try as hard as they want to to get out of under God's law. They will even fashion their own law, and we'll get into that in a minute, in order to get out of under God's law. And, and they, they squirm and they weasel around to say, no, 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 I'm, I'm not under God's law. And, and we as witnesses of the truth must say, no. You will always be under God's law. But God's law is not only there to show you how, how great you are made and esteemed by God as God has made the first man in his image and how a high title and calling he had, but also then the law shows us how far we have fallen and how we might be made right through the gospel. We are not made right through the law, our doing of the law. We are made right by God's, by Christ's doing of the law performing the law, and we believe that as it is connected and revealed in the gospel. Okay. Yes? Yeah, yeah. And I would say even Eve exemplifies that. And Adam. You know, that blame shifting, that was looking for a clause in the law or something where they can weasel out. Hey, you gave me this woman. Or Eve, you said don't even touch it. No, 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 no. You know, and so there is... Uh, and is that them creating their own law? Yeah, yeah. Now, when it comes to creating their own law, we'll get into that in a minute. I have some lengthy quotes and uh, I think this is just like glorious. I, I hope you read section two and walked away thinking, wow, that, that was me. And now it's not me. And that's all because of grace through faith in Christ, who is our performer of the law. So the law, the second section, law as given to Adam in the form of the covenant of works. Um, we talked about the covenant of works last lecture and I gave you some introductory comments about that. He's working off of a presupposition that there is a covenant of works and a covenant of grace. And Adam is a federal representative, a federal head. Uh, Romans 5.18, 1 Corinthians 15.22 
all in Adam die, all in Christ will be made alive. There are two heads of humanity, and in Adam's humanity, he represents us. What he does, we would be credited with. Since he fell, we are credited, or the theological word is imputed, with sin and guilt and pollution. So, briefly here, the covenant of works, he has, I think, three subheadings under this. The covenant of works demands perfect, personal, perpetual obedience for life. Now, you should read that and think, who can do that? The covenant of works demands perfect, personal, and perpetual obedience for life. So we'll, we'll read this in Genesis chapter 2 here. Flip back there. Genesis 2, 16. Here is, a, here is the covenant of works in law form. He uses that. And, you know, I'm not going to get into... He, for, he had a couple pages there where he talks about the covenant of works in law form and yet the covenant of works proposed and then accepted and it's different from the law, but it's one and the same with the law. If you want to get into that, by all means, I don't think it's necessary to understand what he's saying, but, but here is what he would conclude with that the covenant of works is, here's a law of it. 216, and Yahweh God commanded the man saying, you may surely eat of every tree of the garden. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. So here is his comment on that passage. Um, and I don't have a page number. Sorry, I thought I had it on there. He says, the law then, as a covenant of works, excuse me, the law then, as the covenant of works, does in the most authoritative manner Demand from every descendant of Adam who was under it perfect, oh, perfect holiness of nature. Okay? Shaking. That we would be trembling. Perfect holiness of nature. Perfect righteousness of life. So holiness of nature means our, our being, our, our, our nature is holy. Perfect righteousness of life means all of our actions and thoughts and deeds are perfect and complete satisfaction for sin. And none of the race of fallen Adam can ever enter heaven unless he either answers these three demands perfectly in his own person or accepts by faith the consummate righteousness of the second Adam, who is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. Th that is, that's the, that's the offer. Live perfectly, be perfect in your very heart and your very soul, and atone if you have any misgivings, any sins, any failures, in any small part, any jot or tittle of the law that is broken, you must atone for that. Or you abandon that whole thing and say, I I'm not worthy. I am a full fledged law breaker. I own that title. It is an accurate description of me, and I will forever be in that place should God not rescue me. Please have mercy upon me. I believe Christ has lived for me, and that is the way out of the covenant of works. Perfect obedience. Do and live, which includes do or die, or live by faith alone. Now, in this second subsection of the second section, he titles it, in the law as a covenant of works, there is also a gracious promise if he obeyed. So he is saying here in 2, 16 and 17, even though he gives this prohibition, I'm sorry, he, he gives a command, you may surely eat of anything. Here's the prohibition. Don't eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And the consequence of that is you will most surely die. Or in, as the Hebrew says, you will die and die. <laughs> 
you will most surely die. He says, implied there, and this, is, this isn't what all would say, but many in the Reformed tradition would, would agree with, it implies life. But if you do not eat of the tree of knowledge and good and evil, and you eat of the tree of life, both of which are in the middle of the garden, you will surely live, okay? And Calhoun, others believe that implicit life is in there because of how Jesus and Paul speak of this obedience unto life or death in their ministry. So if you go to Matthew 19, We have the story of the rich young man, as titled in the ESV, Rich Young Ruler. And he says, uh, Matthew says, Behold, a man came up to him, coming up to Jesus, saying, Teacher, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? Okay. What, What is inherent in the question? What does the question presuppose? Works. Exactly. Yes. Oh, yeah, I can do this, right? Yeah. Jesus said to him, Why do you ask me about what is good? There is only one who is good. If you would enter life, keep the commandments. So many many theologians would say, just like John Cahoon, and and again, Law and Gospel is not an infallible book, but there are a lot of good truths in there. He says, The covenant works is implying do and live, and do or die. If you want to obey unto life, keep the commandments. You'll live. And of course, he goes on and says, which ones? Jesus says, you shall not murder, don't commit adultery, don't steal, don't bear false witness. Honor your father and mother and love your neighbor as yourself. The young man, glowing, I'm sure. All these I have kept. What do I still lack? You know. I wonder how the rich young ruler reads Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not lack. Does he lack because of his own obedience? In his eyes, he has no lack because of his own obedience. In David's eyes, he has no lack because the Lord is his shepherd. Are we looking in ourselves or are we looking out to someone else, right? Jesus said in verse uh, 21, if you would be perfect, perfect, Go. Sell what you possess and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. Question, is that law or is that gospel? That's law. That's law. He is trying to pin the rich young ruler down on the mat and say, this is the level of obedience you must do. Not only the moral law, the Sinai law, but here, you got to sell all your possessions, give to the poor, and then he holds out life. Now, holding out life isn't gospel, because the covenant of works does that. But this is law in the sense of, if you want to do, that's law. Okay, so go over to Luke chapter 10. And, and to be honest with you, brothers and sisters, this is... This can be a paradigm shift in how God in Christ is ministering the gospel or the law, you know? In Luke 10, we have the Good Samaritan starting on verse 25. He puts him to the test. But a similar situation, they, they kind of go back and forth, what's written in the law. Jesus says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, Oh, excuse me, this is the, the good, um, this is the lawyer saying this. You shall love the Lord your God with all your hearts, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus said to him, you have answered correctly, do this and you will live. So there's the implicit answer there. The covenant of works isn't all death and condemnation. It is giving life if you obey personally, perfect, perfect, perfectly, personally, and perpetually. 
And, and this, is, this is, I think, where Calhoun's counseling pastoral heart comes out. Page 22. He says, he talks about the legalist, okay? He talks about the legalist citing Matthew 19, Luke 10. And he says, the legalist admits his obedience is not perfect, yet relies on it as a title or a deed for eternal life. You see what that is? The legalist isn't, oh, I'm perfect. There are plenty of those. But the, the religious legalist, the squirmy legalist, admits his obedience is not perfect, but he sets up an alternate form of reconciliation. Not God's law, his own law. So the legalist makes his own covenant of works to attain the eternal life and asserts that God is bound to give it to him based on it. Okay, that's what the legalist does. And, and we see this everywhere. Well, I'm no Hitler. I'm no Saddam Hussein or whoever your worst person is. And what are they doing? They're squirming out from under God's law and they're establishing their own standard of morality and saying, and I, I can live up to that. But even the legalists can't live up to that. No one can live up to that. So he has this lengthy quote. This is brilliant. This is on, on page 23. Who's the, who's the legalist? He gives the unbelieving Jews and the Christians in Galatia as an example. Page 23. The unbelieving Jews who sought righteousness by works of the law were not so very ignorant or presumptuous as to pretend to perfect obedience. So he's saying that the non-believing Jew doesn't assert that they're perfect. They just presume that there is another standard by which they can be reconciled by. Okay? He goes on. Neither did those professing Christians in Galatia who desired to be under the law and to be justified by the law of whom the apostle therefore testified that they have fallen from grace, did they presume to plead that they could yield perfect obedience? On the contrary, their public profession of Christianity shows that they had some sense of their need of Christ's righteousness. And listen to what he says next. But their great error was this. They did not believe that the righteousness of Jesus Christ alone was sufficient to entitle them to the justification of life. And therefore, they depended for justification partly on their own obedience to the moral and ceremonial law. Tricky, tricky devils we are. Legalists at heart. All of us are. Oh, I, I could never live up to God's holy standard. I fall short at commandment number one. I could never do that. But I think I can do this. I think if I uh, gave money away, sent Christmas cards to the people I've never met in my family, you know, I, I vote right, I, I'm honest on my W-2s, I think God will like that. No, that is not the covenant God has set up. God has said, here's my law, and here are my demands. And you will either obey them or die. Or flee and receive me. And yet, this is, this is who we are. We're, we're, we're legalist Jews, or we're like the Christians in Galatia. He goes on. He says, this is the same paragraph. It was this. This is the... Um, the alternate form of covenant of works that, that we do, the Galatians do, it was this, and not their pretensions to perfect obedience, that the apostle had in view when he blamed them for cleaving to the law of works and for expecting justification by works of the law. Just a little later on, Christ had become of no effect to them, and they were debtors to the whole law. The great design of our apostle then was to draw them off from their false views of the law to direct them to right conceptions of it 
in its covenant form in which no in which it can admit of no personal obedience as a condition of life, but such as is perfect, and so to destroy their legal hopes as well as their, to confute their own notions. So namely, either obey the law, all the law, go all the way with the law, or don't. And say, I'm a, I'm a failure to the law. The law hangs over me. Please receive this prayer, be merciful to me. And the gospel comes and saves. But he says here, there is no personal obedience for our justification. None, he says, uh, he uses the word, he'll use the word legal and evangelical. And when he, when he uses the word legal, he means uh, merit-based. Uh, actions uh, that one does because they're a legalist. If I do these things, I'll be approved by God. The, that's, a, that's a legal work, right? The evangelical work is uh, good works, faith, repentance, and things. But he says, even the evangelical work is not the basis of our righteousness, Even believers, and this is evident by Galatia, even believers live like legalists without knowing it. If we try to smuggle any little bit of work as if we need to polish up Christ's righteousness. He says this on page 24. Faith is not part of justifying righteousness. Yes, Even faith is not a work whereby we possess, grab, receive righteousness. He says, it is one thing to be justified by faith merely as an instrument by which a man receives the righteousness of Christ and another to be justified for faith as an act or work of the law. So if you view faith as, oh, there's, there's, a, there's a clause in the law where if I believe I am thus, I am thus uh, saved or reconciled. No, faith is not of the law. He says, if a sinner then relies on his actings of faith or works of obedience to any of the commands of the law for a title to eternal life, he seeks to be justified by the works of the law as really as if his works were perfect. If he depends, you should underline this part, it's page 24. If he depends either in whole or in part on his faith and repentance for a right to any promised blessing, he thereby so annexes that promise to the commands to believe and repent as to form them for himself into a covenant of works. He is so clearly and fully scriptural. Law, gospel, obedience to life, even by thinking my faith is a work or just Faith as an open hand, I only receive, Lord, what you would put in it. There is a world of difference. There is a heaven and hell difference between faith as a work. The ground and the basis of your acceptance and the faith as an instrument. It is not the ground. It is not the ground of our justification. It is an instrument. We just receive. We just receive receive. He quotes Westminster Confession, chapter 11, on saving faith, uh, which is, I think, nearly identical to the uh, London Confession of Faith, which says, those whom God effectually calleth, he also freely justifieth, not by infusing righteousness into them, but by pardoning their sins. And here's what I would underline and by accounting and accepting their persons as righteous, not for anything wrought in them or done by them, but for Christ's sake alone, nor by imputing faith itself. Even imputing faith itself is not the ground. 
the act of believing or any other evangelical obedience to them as their righteousness, but by imputing the obedience and satisfaction of Christ unto them. And they receiving and resting on him and his righteousness by faith, which faith they have, not of themselves, it is a gift of God. So here's the world of a difference. Here's heaven and here's hell. Hell, workspace, legalist mentality is, I believe as the ground of my righteousness. I believe as the basis of my righteousness. Heaven, faith, gospel says, I believe that the righteousness has been imputed to me. I just receive by faith. I make no claim on the quality of my faith as to give me righteousness. No, 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 no. My faith is going to be weak. It's going to be strong. It's going to be hot. It's going to be cold. That is not the ground of righteousness. It is just a gift through receiving by faith. He'll go on and say the covenant of works includes the threat of death. That's a fairly short third section there. This death, he says, is spiritual, temporal, and eternal. The death is spiritual in that they died that day. They fell from grace, they fell from Christ, severed from Christ, and they died spiritually that day. Temporal, we usually use the word physical. There was a physical death. They're gonna die, Adam was gonna die 900 something years later. And there is, of course, an eternal death. The soul that sins shall die, Ezekiel 18, 4. Genesis 2, 16 and 17, we already saw that, the threat of death. So, in summary, I'm going to open up for some questions here in a sec. We see the laws of covenant of works. We see that Adam's sin was plunging him and all of his posterity into sin and misery. And that the covenant of works did have a promise of life implied if obeyed perfectly. But it also showed that the penalty for any and the smallest disobedience. Okay, next time we'll get into the third section. But... That is what I have for this morning. Any questions? Some of this might be a paradigm shift. You know, how Jesus evangelizes, how he uses the law. But this is, um, he's laying the groundwork for understanding God's demands or his gifts. And we don't want to try to fulfill any demands to acquire the gift. We just ask for the gift. (laughs) That's it. And he gives it. And he happily gives it. Right? Okay. Well, let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, thank you for giving us the gospel. Thank you for giving us the law, which shows us our need. You made it impossible, save for your son, to obey the law perfectly to gain life. We admit we cannot do that at all, neither as a non-Christian, nor as a believer. As a Christian, do we recognize any of our works justify us to you? Our best works are filthy rags. They are not clean, even though you sanctify them, even though you are pleased by them, they do not have what it takes to justify us. And so we look to you in the gospel. We thank you that you revealed Christ in the gospel, that he has come freely, the gospel is given freely, and that we come believingly and penitently. Thank you for that illumination, and would you bless the rest of our time this morning?